Well, friends, however you may be joining us at the Foundry today, a special welcome, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Instagram, whether it's the podcast, we are so glad you are here with us to join us. I wanted to start today with a little group therapy. This will be fun, so buckle up. Here we go. Um, When I was eight years old, I decided that I would... uh, I would show off a little bit, so I should preface this by saying um, I have some I have some door issues. Now maybe you remember this because there used to be a day when car doors didn't have those kid-proof locks, right? And so if in my family, if a, if a child all of a sudden while you're going down the highway were to crack the door open, I would have a very distinct emotion. I would freak out, and I think the emotion may be justified because I I kind of know where this was coming from. Um, there's there's no, no real easy way to say this, so I'll just say it. My mom ran me over with the car. Now, now, now you may feel a little validated as to why I would freak out, right? Now, I need to also hit pause. I love my mother, and she sounds evil at this point in the story, but she's totally not, so let's keep this group therapy session going. So, as I mentioned, I was ready to show off, and, and as an eight-year-old, I thought I could solidify the best friend status by jumping out of the car as my mom pulled into the driveway. I had timed it perfectly. The door was already unlocked. My seat belt was off. It's cracked open, and my mom made that left-hand turn in the driveway, and evil Knievel set into my mindset, and I knew that this was my moment to solidify the best friend status. Now, some of us inherently know what it's like to be the clumsy kid. Yes. So I still, to this day, I'm not sure what happened. I may have caught my foot on the floorboard, on the frame of the car, even on the seatbelt, who knows. But what I do know is this. On my exit jump, I had a little tumble and my leg went flailing underneath the car and my mom did the unthinkable. She drove over my leg. Now, now, okay, bear with me. It's a little hard. So you would think that that would be traumatic enough, but what happened next may shock you. My mom heard my cries for anguish. I wasn't just casually like, Mom, 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 Mommy. I, in, as I was crying out in anguish, she thought the car was still pinned up against my leg. So she did the unthinkable. She put the car in reverse and drove over my leg a second time. And you're like, finally, resolution healing, comfort, ER, whatever's happening next. Thankfully, this story is about to end. Wrong. At this point, my brother and my best friend had exited the vehicle, and they're relaying as first responders the up-to-speed information for my mom, and they tell her, you are still on his leg. So the car goes back into drive, and if you're keeping score at home, it is now a commanding 3 nothing lead for Linda and the Volvo. Probably an insurmountable lead at this point. There's not much I can do at this point. But when we get to the hospital, you could actually see the imprint of the tire tread on my leg from this, uh, this ordeal. But you can get a sense as to why I have door issues, right? See, in my mind, and again, I love my mom. Let's just make sure we set that record straight. Linda, if you're watching, we're good. Uh, but... As you can sense, I, I have some door issues, right? You get a sense in my psyche. But see, in, in my mind, if I can lock the door, if I can shut the door, if I can close the door, I will be safe. Doors represent security for me. And in an interesting twist, Jesus seems to articulate a very similar thought that doors represent security. So more on that in just a moment. First... Let's set the table. We are in our sixth week as we look at our sixth church in the seven letters to the seven churches written about in Revelation. And tonight we come to the church in Philadelphia, and yes, it seems like a bad pun. They asked Phil to fill in on Philadelphia. I'm so sorry. (laughs) This is the cards I was dealt. But finally, you're like, oh, a North American church, right? Finally, Philadelphia, USA, here we go. Um, But no, we're not looking at the church in northeast Pennsylvania. 
um, you're wondering why the messenger didn't make a note about the cheesesteak, right, when you did Devo's this week. But there's a reason, because we're talking about the ancient city of Philadelphia, and if we had a plane fueled up outside, we would fly from Zeeland, probably land in Istanbul in Turkey, and then have about a five-hour drive south to what is known as the ancient city of Philadelphia. And this church is very fascinating because there are still some ruins left of what they call St. John's Church. The ruins, uh, there are actually were six original columns. We'll put a picture up right here. There were six original columns of this church. Only three are still standing today. But again, remember, Christ wrote a letter to a very real people in a very real place at a very specific time. So we're talking about the church in Philadelphia. We're talking about modern-day Turkey. And this church is unique for a lot of reasons. First, it was, one of the, it was the only church that didn't have that blemish on its record, right? So oftentimes in this series, we've heard this phrase, but nevertheless, I hold this against you, right? There's, there's always this kind of sense of, church, I love you, but here's what you can do better, that Christ implores his church. But this church is free from all accusation and free from all condemnation. In other words, it is the church that Christ delights in. And it is also, as you guessed, the city of brotherly love. The city of Philadelphia was founded by the king of Pergamum. His nickname was Philadelphus. And so he loved his brother and named this city in honor of his brother around 150 B.C. And also most church historians believe that it was the smallest of the seven churches written about in Revelation. But to summarize their experience, friends, we could say it like this. The church in Philadelphia was going through neglect and betrayal. Neglect and betrayal, both culturally and spiritually. Let's unpack cultural betrayal first. See, Philadelphia used to be a part of a great trade route throughout Asia. In fact, it was renowned for its vineyards and its grapes. If you wanted to put it into a North American context, it was very Napa-like. But these vineyards were so good, they were starting to actually undercut the Roman emperor's domination on this global marketplace for wine. It was starting to actually compete with the vineyards in Rome. And if you know anything about taking on the empire, you don't take on the empire and win. And that is exactly what happened. The ego-driven emperor Domitian ordered that all of these vineyards were to be torn out of Philadelphia. And this was such a vital part of their economic infrastructure. You can imagine that cultural and economic rejection as these vineyards were torn out. You can imagine that sense of just breaking the backbone of their economy. But again, this rejection wasn't just cultural, it wasn't just economic. The Christians living in Philadelphia were also experiencing very much a rejection spiritually. See, in those early days of the Christian faith, the Christians still felt very at home worshiping at the synagogue. The synagogue simply meaning the Jewish place of worship. We would call it a church. Their place of worship was known as the synagogue. But the early Christians still felt very at home here. They could still hear the Old Testament scriptures read and taught. They could still worship together, and it still kind of felt like that family reunion. Even though we had split on the person of Christ, it was still kind of that spot where you're like, I feel, I feel good here. It's okay. It's still accepting. But in due time, as these Christians begin to always be talking about the Messiah, the risen Messiah, the King of kings and Lord of lords, you can imagine that the Jews in the synagogue got a little tired of hearing of all of this Jesus talk, right? After a while, it's like, look, we welcomed you here, but you need to just pump the brakes on the Jesus talk, right? But these Christians wouldn't. As their fervor for proclaiming the risen Messiah continued over and over, finally the Jews had had enough. Finally, it's like, look, we're giving you the boot. You are out of the synagogue. You are kicked out. And so what started happening was this systematic persecution of the Christians by the Jews. Imagine it like this. At best, they were telling these Christians, you are misguided, right? You've got some bad ideas about God. But at worst, what they were saying to their face is point blank, you don't know God. We know God. You're just flat out wrong. 
and you start to sense this betrayal, spiritually speaking. But it wasn't just that they couldn't worship at the synagogue. It was bigger than that. It was bigger than that in the sense that the synagogue was still the cultural and social center of their lives. Imagine a Christian in Philadelphia around that hour of worship walking through the streets and all of a sudden someone sees them and they say, why aren't you in service right now? Why aren't you at the synagogue? Like it was that type of regimental. That was where their their world was centered around. And imagine that that Christian tries to go up to the front door of the synagogue and gets in and there's that that smack of that door as it slams shut in their face, that sense of rejection, that is a haunting sound, is it not, when you hear that door slammed in your face? But even more so than just being rejected, there's also an underlying bigger theme going on. Matt talked about this a few weeks back with the church in Smyrna. See, if these believers were still had their name on the rolls or on the roster at the synagogue, they were exempt from proclaiming that Caesar is Lord. Friends, remember, this is still Roman-occupied territory, right? And in a very real sense, if they didn't proclaim Caesar as Lord, their lives were at stake. If Rome came in and checked on them, and their names were not written down at the synagogue, yes, they could actually be killed for it. And so when you're kicked out of the synagogue, yes, it's a cultural rejection, it's a spiritual rejection, but in a very real sense, they felt that imminent danger that this could be death. So, this sense of exclusion, it just cut so deep. And you can imagine what it felt like now to be a Christ follower in Philadelphia, right? No real allies, persecuted on all sides, whether it's from Rome or whether it's from the Jews. You felt like that pressure cooker was just squeezing in on you. Heard over and over again, you don't know God. You've got the wrong ideas about faith. You've got the wrong beliefs. You're misguided. You're heretics. And around every corner, a shut door. So with that in mind, let's now listen in to what Christ himself writes to this struggling, doubt-ridden church just barely hanging on in this town called Philadelphia. He says this, flip with me, tap on your screens over to Revelation chapter 3, verse 7 as we go through the scripture. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true, Who holds the key of David? What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God." Never again will they leave it. I will write my name on them, the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. I will also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears to hear what the Spirit says to the churches, let them hear. So there's something amazing that Christ teaches every time we hear one of these letters to the churches. And in this letter, it's no different, but we hear something that we haven't heard before. Jesus says something very unusual in verse 7. He says, I hold the key of David, to which most of us at that point raise an eyebrow and go, the key of David? Question mark. What is the key of David? There's so much Jewish, Jewish imagery in this, so let's dive in and try and unpack this just a little bit. This key of David, it signified power and control. It was an actual key. It was a wooden key, a large wooden key, which is a fascinating image if you think about somebody with a key ring. But it was a key that signified power and control over the city of Jerusalem. And it's a direct allusion back to Scripture, back to Isaiah chapter 22. 
And there's a lot we could say about it, but here is the major story. We're going to put it up on the screen. There was two men, Eliakim and Shebna. And imagine this key like a master key, right? Something a palace administrator would have, almost like a key to the city. Like if you were a if you were a building administrator, you would have that all-access key. And this key of David was very much like that all-access key that would get you into any room, right? It had that security clearance that says, I'm kind of a big deal. And Jesus is directly quoting this passage, but in doing so, he's doing something so Jesus-like. He is saying, I am the fulfillment of this prophecy. I am bringing this promise to life in your presence, And when he quotes this scripture, that audience in Philadelphia, their ears would have perked up because they would have known the story. They would have recognized those characters. And when they heard it, they would have realized what Jesus was doing when he's doubling down on this imagery of saying, I now hold the key of David. Jesus is saying he's now the new key holder to the city. He's taking the familiar and he's bringing it to life. But catch this. In the same way that Eliakim got the key to Jerusalem, Jesus is now saying that he has the key to the kingdom of God, the key to eternal life, and the key to heaven. He's telling this struggling church that I have complete control. Jesus also sees doors as security, but that security rests entirely in him. Have you ever been the key holder in that 11th hour, aren't you like the man or the woman of the hour when you arrive to your group of locked out friends, key overhead triumphantly? Like, you guys are so happy to see me right now. But Jesus' words must have been so reassuring to the Christians in Philadelphia because even though that door to the synagogue was slammed shut on their face, he is now saying, I have the key and that door is wide open because of me. So the next question is this, what does Jesus do with this key of David? He says, I open doors that are closed, and I close doors that are open. But I think it's bigger than that. Theologically, spiritually, what is happening? Again, he's saying he has the authority over heaven and hell, over salvation and judgment. He alone is the one who's deciding who gets in and out. Doors do this for us all the time, right? It's insider-outsider language. But he's saying he has the key to heaven and hell. And this language is so similar to exactly what he's been teaching his disciples this whole time. Flashback to John 10, 9, he says, I am the gate. Another word for gate is door. Whoever enters through me will be saved. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father unless through me. So flash back now, what is this church struggling with? With crippling doubt second-guessing their place in the God. Do we still have access to the Father? Do we still have an open door? Are we still accepted? And he reassures them that he alone decides who gets in and who gets out. No one else gets to decide their spiritual fate but Christ and Christ alone. They can rest assured that the gatekeeper knows them. Now, besides this key of David, there's a very another interesting reference, and it happens in verse 9, and Jesus calls those Jews in the city of Philadelphia, a very interesting phrase. He refers to them as the synagogue of Satan. And it's not just Jesus giving an insult. That's not at all what's happening. He's actually saying to the church, I understand your persecution, right? He's saying, I understand that they've rejected you. I understand that they told you that you are misguided, that you're a deserter of the true faith. But what does he say? He says, I know the heart, the mind, and the motive, and I'm judging them not to be actual, legitimate Jews at all. I'm judging them to be liars. But he understands and he relates to that persecution that they're going through. He's speaking directly about it. He's telling them, look, remember, I know the charge against you that that they're saying you've got it all wrong. But when someone says your beliefs are wrong... What is it in that moment that we so desperately crave? I think it's two things. I think it's to be comforted and it's to be vindicated. And Jesus does both of those things in that moment. Look at the honor that Christ is giving this church. He's saying, hold on because I love you and my love for you will show everybody that you truly belong to me. He's saying, these Jews, when, this all, when the dust settles on all of this, they're going to see my love for you. 
He's saying they're going to see my sovereignty because of my commitment to my bride. And again, it's language very consistent with Scripture. You hear a word all the time here, covenant. It just means we believe that God loves his people so much that he promises that they will always be his people. Right? That's what a covenant is. It's God who says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I could never turn my back on you. Right? And the world will bow the knee to this faithful God. He says this line, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. That sentence, that I have loved you, in the Greek, the I is emphatic. Let me repeat that. The I is emphatic. He's saying, I love you. In other words, circle it, underline it, put an exclamation mark by it. Whatever you need to do, understand that he's declaring his love for this church that's barely hanging on. Jesus is saying this blessing is something so divine, so heavenly. It's not us at bragging camp saying, we're going to prove these people right. We're going to do it ourselves. We're going to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Our good behavior is going to point them to the true Messiah. Christ is saying, no, it all hinges upon me. As Eric said last week, he's that cornerstone, that bedrock. He's the one who will love us to the end. He's the one who will give us the strength to endure. He's the one that's going to make all of this happen. And even our enemies will see this peculiar divine love. When the tank is on E and you don't feel like there's anything left, it is him that they will see. So let me ask you this question. What would this letter have meant to this struggling, doubt-ridden church in Philadelphia? And I think the answer is a resounding everything. Everything. Because when that door was slammed shut on their face, Christ says, hang on, because what I'm about to do, no one is going to undo. When culture says that their beliefs are false, he says, I love you. And at the end, they're going to see me and they're going to see my commitment to my people. It's Jesus saying, when the dust settles and all of this is said and done, you're going to be right here with me. Can you sense that these believers living in Philadelphia would have read this letter and come away with a deep sense that they serve a God who intimately knows their struggle? Can you sense that they would have believed that they served a God who related to the persecution that they were going through? You bet. Absolutely, wholeheartedly. And now let's pivot a little bit. See, I think we get a sense of what this would have meant to the church in Philadelphia. What does it mean to us? What does it mean to the scattered church in Zealand? What does it practically have to say to us? First, I believe that the concept of open doors to those who have felt kicked out still applies. See, for many of us, you don't need a pastor in a church to tell you that you've messed up. You don't need someone to stand up here and tell you that you've got this, this sense of brokenness, right? But there is still a weird dynamic in play. And I think we've all felt it to some degree. And there's that sense that some sins are going to get you kicked out of this thing. There are sense that there are some mistakes you just can't recover from. There is this sense that there's a brokenness that you just can't redeem, right? That you are somehow too far gone, right? There's that sense that maybe you've just been excommunicated, that this door you feel like is going to be shut forever, For some of us who have run away from God time and time again, you feel like there's just no way I can come back to church. Or if you have come back to church, maybe you're saying this, well, I'll probably never be able to serve again. I'll never be able to volunteer. I'll never be able to get involved. I'll never be able to give back. Right? I, too, at one point believed that that ship had sailed. As someone who had left my ministry position as a youth pastor was driving semi-trucks five days a week, I would have told you that that door was closed. I would have told you that I was that person that I was fairly convinced God was done with. I had put in my time and it just hadn't worked out and I didn't think there would ever be anything else for me. Some of us, it's our hidden sins. You're like, Phil, if there's a padlock on the gates of heaven, it's because of what I did, right? Maybe it's hidden sins. Maybe it's moral failures. Maybe you have a sordid past to which I say, welcome to the club. We've all felt that. Back in my youth ministry days, I had a student, and I met with him, and he had made a pretty good mess of his life through a myriad of mistakes and just just rebellion, sinful living. But I remember when he pulled me aside, and he's like, I don't think I can come back to church. And I'm like, 
First, that's not true. You're always welcome here. But secondly, he went on to describe this scenario, and he's like, the more he talked, I got, I got this visual. It was like a prison sentence that he believed he had to put all on his shoulders and pay that penance and serve his time, right? It was like, how much self-guilt, condemnation, and shame can one person endure? And he's sitting in this prison cell, and I just remember this visual, and I just remember telling him, I'm like, you are not locked out. This door actually is wide open, right? The grace and mercy poured out on us through Christ Open that door. What is it that Paul said in Colossians? He said, you were once alienated because of your evil behavior, but now through Christ's death on the cross, there is reconciliation. What is it that I'm trying to say? I'm trying to say that the door is wide open. You can't undo that. No amount of self-punishment or self-loathing or unforgiving yourself could keep you in that prison cell. But yet he insisted, he's like, I got to stay here. I have to stay here. And that visual was just so haunting. I'm like, who would sit in a prison cell when the door is wide open? Right? Picture it. But we do this all the time. So remember, if Christ has opened the door, then the door is open. If Christ has set you free, then you are free indeed. None of our unwritten codes or or rule changes can overcome his authority on this issue. Not even... Not even that self-loathing. The worst of us is forgiven and made new in Christ. Our past mistakes don't negate his death and resurrection and victory over sin. And some of you need to hear that so loud and clearly today. You can come back to faith. You can come back to God. You are not too far gone. Not even you. Secondly, I believe this message is for us in the sense that we have open doors in Christ even when we feel like we're no longer welcome at the cultural table, right? I think a lot of us inherently are feeling this sense that culture is becoming a little bit more hostile to the Christian faith, right? And maybe we haven't endured direct persecution, but we sense those subtle shifts, right? We sense that Times are just changing a little bit. We used to feel like we had this place at the table and now there's these undertones of what it means to be the church in exile, right? Maybe the accusation, you've heard it yourself. Maybe the accusation was, your religion is just a crutch to help you get through hard times. Maybe you've heard that charge that your faith is antiquated, it's outdated, you're bigoted, you're closed-minded, right? You hold fast to this ancient faith and, and we've just moved on from it. What's the reminder, though? Same as it was to the church in Philadelphia. We still have an open door to the kingdom. 20 years ago, you talk about being involved in a church. Everyone talked that way. If you were a pastor 20 years ago, you felt like you had a seat of honor and privilege. You could walk into any social circle and say, I'm a pastor, and be welcome. We could walk into those circles and be like, I'm a Christian, and nobody would raise an eyebrow at it. But now we feel those subtle shifts. We're like, Culture shifted, and it may never, ever come back to that sense of, like, it's returning to godliness. But the door is still open to being with Christ. Yes, society may push us out of this seat of honor and recognition. Yes, it may shift continually downhill. It may go south in a hurry. But what did Jesus say? He said, hold tight. He said, I love you. He said, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you too. So I started today by talking about the fact that I have a strange relationship with doors. And in my house growing up, there was only actually one one room that had a a lock on it. I don't know if your house was similar, but for me, it was the bathroom door. And as a middle child, much like the church in Philadelphia, we faced persecution on all sides, from the perfect oldest child to the precious baby of the family. Middle children understand this struggle and they know the struggle is real. Am I right, middle children here? Yes, yes and amen. The struggle is very real. Now see, in my house though, this sibling rivalry would often involve a lot of chasing, a lot of tagging, a lot of running through the house and to get to a place of security, you had to get to this bathroom door. Now I don't know if if you ever experienced this, but for me, if you could make it to the bathroom and you could just start like with those other two ganging up on you, there'd be like this harrowing scene, right, where there's that pushing and pulling and it's like going in slow motion, like 
millimeters of progress. And all of a sudden, like out of a scene in a horror movie, from your side of the door, you see your brother's four fingers wrap around on your side. And you're like, this door's got to close. I don't care if he's getting nubs. I have to shut this door. Those fingers can probably be sewn back on, and someone's going home with nubs today. That was that type of desperation as you struggled to gain security of the bathroom door. And I just remember, and even as parents, like, parents in the room will identify the struggle. Like, there's that sense when there's slamming doors in your house, like, every alarm deep in your soul and your psyche goes off. You're like, like, uh uh-oh, nubs, nubs, who just got nubs? Like, fingers, doors, danger. But that's how intense this struggle for the locked door was for me. But I've that security I felt behind that locked door is the same sense of security that Christ is giving his church. And so now what? If culture does go south and the church goes through a refinement process, we still have Christ. If culture rejects us or even worse, persecutes us, we still have Christ. We still have all we need. Even if we become the church in exile, we still have Christ. Christ. Look at what it has done to the church in China. You try and shut it down and God just goes, watch what I'm going to do with this. Remember and hold fast to this. He alone has the authority to open and close doors. He says it again in Revelation 1.8, I alone hold the keys to hell and death. In other words, he's not just the key holder. He's not just the door opener. He's not just the door closer. He is the victor. So friends, let me end with this. Here is the promise. For those of us that feel locked out, he is the victor. He is the final word. So you just hold on. This is what we proclaim. That nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. What other language could I possibly use? What else could I possibly say? There is literally nothing else that says it better because Scripture is so perfect on this. In Romans 8, Paul writes this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present or the future, and all the uncertainty that we feel in that little sentence. Nor any powers, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So friends, run to him or run back to him or run to him for the first time. Just run to him because the door is wide open. Nothing will ever change that. Friends, nothing will ever overcome that. Church, hold fast to that promise. Let's pray. Father, in times of uncertainty, we need your sovereignty. In times of of doubt or fear and anxiety, we need a Savior who says, I am victorious over all of this. Jesus, you are enough. Jesus, you are our all in all. You are the answer to all of these longings. Thank you for opening every door for your church to know that we are still one with the Father and one with the Son and are filled with the Holy Spirit because of your commitment, your unwavering, unfailing commitment to this, your church, your bride. Open our ears, Lord, that we may hear your voice calling us to run home even as the church remains scattered in this moment, in this time. It is in your Son's amazing name we pray all these things. Amen. Thanks for tuning in to watch this week's message. If you're looking for a way to prepare for next week, click the link below in the description box. There's where you'll find devotions. Now devotions are a crucial part of the Foundry's weekly rhythm. I hope this message has been encouraging, but also challenging for you. And we'd love to see you again next week.